Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining tonight's presentation. Before we get into this session on water protection, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory that we are hosting this virtual session on. I am broadcasting from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. I would like you all to consider the traditional territory that you are watching this session from. Next slide, please. I want to welcome everyone. This is the third of our information sessions, which we are holding to share information with the South Bruce community and answer any questions you may have about our project. As you may be aware, South Bruce is one of two potential locations in Ontario for Canada's Deep Geological Repository Project, or DGR. As we indicated at our last session, normally we would conduct a meeting like this in person. However, as you know, the COVID-19 situation is such that in-person events are difficult to conduct safely. We hope to get back to doing in-person events very soon, but in the meantime, We'll continue to hold sessions like these so we can answer all your questions. Today's presentation will focus on water resources, what they are, how they work, and how they'll be kept safe during all stages of our project in whatever host community is selected for our repository. We'll also take you through our work understanding water resources here in South Bruce. And then we'll have a live Q&A at the end of the session with both questions we commonly hear in the community and questions submitted here today. On the right side of your screen, you should see a button for Q&A. That will send your questions our way. Feel free to submit questions throughout the session. My colleagues are watching the feed and we will answer the questions at the end of the session. We'll also be circulating answers to all questions submitted today to attendees. If you registered on Eventbrite, we should already have your email. But if not, please email us at learnmore at nwmo.ca to receive a copy. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Chantal Madri. I have a master's in radiation physics, and I'm a senior scientist in the safety and technical research group and have been with the NWMO for 12 years. My work centers on assessing the safety of the repository concept both during the operational phase and in the long term after the repository closure, with a particular focus on the biosphere. And on a personal note, I'm also an outdoor enthusiast. I love to hike, cross-country ski, bike, and I especially love canoe tripping. So to me, keeping the environment clean and the water fresh and safe to use is very important. I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Alec Blythe. Alec? Hi, thank you, Chantal. Um, my name is Alec Blythe and I'm a geoscientist with NWMO. I'll give you a little background about myself. I'm a professional geologist with a PhD from the University of Waterloo. I have over 30 years experience in geology, hydrogeology and geochemistry in several countries, Canada, Finland, Sweden and Australia. Um, I'm currently the section manager of geoscientific, geoscientific site evaluations here at the NWMO. Chantal, back to you. Thank you, Alec. In our last session, we gave you an introduction to the multiple barrier system, how our five standalone barriers work together to protect people and the environment. As part of that introduction, we also gave you an introduction to the geosphere, one of the barriers, and the one we'll be focusing on today. We also had a live Q&A at the last session, and as mentioned, we'll have one tonight as well. Next slide, please. We know that there have been questions about water protection in South Bruce. That's why in today's session, we want to cover this topic in more depth. That is water resources, what they are, how they exist naturally, and how they will be protected after the multiple barrier system is constructed. Before we get into water, I wanted to give everyone a refresher on how our deep geological repository is built. Next slide, please. This is a, an illustration of the whole of our deep geological repository. It will consist of surface facilities where the used fuel will be packaged in long lived containers, the used fuel containers you see on the screen. 
and a series of placement rooms deep underground where used nuclear fuel containers will be sealed in a suitable rock formation, a strong, tight rock using a natural clay that is proven to be a powerful barrier to water flow known as bentonite clay. The DGR method is a long-term management approach that is being pursued by all countries with nuclear programs. Why? Because it is the safest method we have today to protect people and the environment for generations to come. And most importantly, it's the method that Canadians told us represents the best, their priorities, objectives, and principles. Next slide, please. This is what an underground emplacement room looks in the, uh, in the repository. This figure represents each element of our multiple barrier system, a series of five engineered and natural barriers that work together to protect people and the environment. Each barrier can be described independently, but they work together in harmony to provide safety. In our last session, we went through the multiple barrier system in more detail, but just as a refresher, these are the five barriers. The first is the used fuel pellet itself, which is uranium dioxide powder furnace baked into a hard ceramic. Ceramics are one of the most durable engineered materials. Most importantly for our session tonight, they do not readily dissolve in water, which is the only way for radioactive material to escape from the fuel pellet. The second barrier is the fuel bundle. Each fuel bundle is composed of a number of sealed tubes called fuel elements. It is clad in a material known as zircaloy, which is extremely strong and resistant to corrosion. The third barrier is the used fuel container, a very robust and long-lived container that is clad in copper, which we know to be a very good barrier against corrosion. The fourth barrier is the clay exterior. All empty space is filled with bentonite clay, a natural clay, which as I just mentioned, is proven to be a powerful barrier to water flow. And the fifth barrier is the geosphere, hundreds of meters of rock through which water cannot pass in any appreciable time frame. We will be discussing the host rock further later in the presentation. That's our multiple barrier system, five layers working together. If any single layer should fail, the others are there to provide backup. And all of them are extremely resistant to water. Uh, next slide, please. But to understand just how safe this system is, it's best to understand the water itself, how it works, how we interact with it day to day, and how surface water and the underground environment interact, or in this case, do not interact. My colleague Alec will take you through a few further details. Alec? Thanks, Chantel. So this is where it starts. This is a water cycle. You probably all remember this from elementary school. It's probably been a while, so let's uh, let's do a little refresher on this. So water evaporates from the lakes and streams and it evapo uh, transpires from plants, condenses into clouds, and then rain, uh, falls back as, as rain uh, and snow, so it's precipitation to the ground. Most of the precipitation hits the ground and uh, and runs over the ground back into those streams and lakes. A very small portion, usually somewhere around two to five percent, actually soaks into the ground. And this is what we call infiltration. And then it moves through and flows through the ground. The length of this cycle can vary, and we call this the residence time of the water. What it really is, though, is, is, is the age of the water. So the more complex the path that this water is taking, the longer it takes to complete the cycle. This figure emphasizes the above uh, ground portion, but let's let's have a look at uh, what's below the ground. Next slide, please. So this is a deep geological repository in context. As you can see, it's built well. Uh, the repository is built well below the ground surface. This is the geosphere, the host rock in which our repository will be built. There are hundreds of meters of uh, of this host rock between the repository uh, and the water that you and I drink for the local aquifers that you see up on the surface. Should South Bruce be selected as a site for a repository, it'll be about 800 meters uh, below the ground surface, the repository. That's about three times deeper than the deepest portion of Lake Huron. 
it is very, very difficult for water to move through all through all this rock. Let me give me an example to demonstrate how difficult it is. The surface water and groundwater, again, this is the water near the top of that figure that you see in green in the upper brown. Um, and, sorry, uh, the surface water that we see, and that's the green that you see up there, uh, is water that you and I interact with every day. This is maybe only a few years old if we were to age date that water, maybe a few tens of years old. As you move down deeper in the bedrock, it becomes more and more scarce to find water. And at depth, there's virtually no flowing water. There's so little water, in fact, that we must literally squeeze the rock to get that water out to do analysis on it. That tiny trace amount of water is very, very old. It's so old, in fact, that it may be the original water that filled the ancient oceans that covered the rock, uh, that covered this area and formed the rock that we see in the area today. It can be up to millions and millions of years old. This is, this is because it takes millions of years for the water to move through that solid rock. So what does that mean? It means the surface water is disconnected from everything that happens deep down in the in the underground. Whatever site we select for a repository, we're building it so deep below that water that we see today that it'll be completely disconnected from anything that happens around our repository. On any appreciable time scale, the surface water will never ever come into contact with the repository. Now it's reasonable to ask, how do we know this? We know this through the work that we do to better understand the geology and water systems of this region. Let me give you a few examples. Next slide, please. The first thing we do is learn from what's out there. This includes taking information from government sources like the Ontario Geological Survey and the Ontario oil, salt, and gas resource library. This is an example on the left is a three-dimensional model of a geology and hydrogeology of Southern Ontario. We also work with, under, with others to understand how water will behave, not just now, but in the future. In the, ne in the near term, this means uh, making sure that our facilities are resilient to climate change. And we're taking into account all the possibilities. But what happens in a future ice age? That's why our repository will be built to withstand the weight of future glaciers. Next, we also need to understand how it behaves immediately underground by measuring and sampling it through monitoring wells like the ones that you see here. Next. We'll frequently also take water samples of both local surface water to understand precisely how water flows in and around Bruce and interacts. And finally, we want to understand the characteristics of the deep rock. Soon, probably in early 2021, we'll begin drilling and taking borehole samples like the ones being studied in this picture to ensure that South Bruce is the perfect geological fit and measuring just how old the tiny trace amount of water that's in the deep rock are. Next slide. Okay, so all this knowledge is valuable in and in itself, but we also have to put it for work protecting South Bruce water resources right now. So first and foremost, safety is built into who we are. We always begin meetings and field work with safety moments. And that means wherever we do our, uh, we are on site, we follow strict health and safety and environmental procedures. We also work to make sure that all of our equipment is surrounded by what we call secondary containment. You see that in this picture. To ensure that any spills like gas or oil from the generator that you see in that picture 
for instance, do not affect the local shallow groundwater. And this is something that you're going to see in, in the community next year. This is a borehole drilling rig and drilling could be messy. We take borehole samples to understand the deep rock and its permeability or the ability to water that uh, for water to move through it or in that in some cases not be able to move through it. We work very hard to ensure that the effects of borehole drilling are contained through managing of fluids used to drill the, to run the drill, installing steel casings to protect water and sampling local water wells before the drilling to show that there's no contamination. Back to you, Chantel. Thanks, Alec. Um, so we know that water resources are very important to people in South Bruce, and that's why we're always working to deepen our relationships with the local community and local organizations of interested citizens. For example, for the last few years, we have worked very closely with the Pine River Watershed Network to support their work in the community. Their flagship events, their tree planting days with local 4-H clubs and more. That's actually Becky Smith, our regional communication manager here in South Bruce at the, at the initiative's annual tree planting event with Dave Grant, one of their board members. We're also working hard to solicit input from residents of South Bruce to determine how they would like the local environment to be monitored. Recently, we hosted a series of virtual and small in-person environment workshops that helped us understand and take into account local concerns when developing an environmental monitoring program. We are continually looking to engage with the community, build understanding of our project and answer questions you may have. That's not just in-person events like our open our recent open house. There's a picture of one of, uh, of one up on the screen right now. It includes virtual events like this very meeting. And we are proud to be one of the first organizations in North America to implement an indigenous knowledge policy as part of our part of our commitment to reconciliation. That's our CEO, Lori Swami in red at the signing ceremony for our reconciliation statement in 2018. Our Indigenous knowledge policy provides advice and guidance about the interweaving and application of Indigenous knowledge with other knowledge systems. It was developed collaboratively with our Council of Elder and Youth, and it informs our work in water protection as well. Next slide, please. So now we move to the question and answer part of tonight's presentation. We'd like to lead off tonight with a few questions that we commonly receive in the community. If you've got a question that isn't covered off in this section, don't worry. As a reminder, there is a Q&A function at the top right of your screen. Please enter your question there. My colleagues are monitoring the feed. Next slide, please. So the first question is, will borehole drilling affect local aquifers? And I'm gonna get Alex to answer this, Alex to answer this question. So this is a great question. It's also a very common one that uh, that we've been getting in the community. So this is this is a good one for to to answer. So clearly, the answer is no. The borehole drilling is not going to affect the local aquifers, but we're going to monitor really closely to be sure. So here are some of the things that we've done. First, we started out by doing baseline testing of over a dozen local water wells close to the proposed borehole sites. We ran short yield tests to see how much water was there. Uh, and then we sampled uh, for a large suite of chemical analyses as well. We're gonna also install and monitor sentinel wells. Uh, these are the closest down gradients, so downflow wells from our deep boreholes. These will be continuously monitored about every five minutes for water levels and daily for a water tracer that we add to our to our drill water. And these will monitor, be monitored during the whole duration of the drilling. So during when we're drilling, we use fresh treated municipal water supply for drilling. All equipment will have secondary containment. I talked about that a little before. Uh, this to prevent spill like gasoline or oil from a generator 
or drill water from from spilling on the onto the surface and it keeps it from reaching the ground surface. Um, so after we drill through the surface sands and gravel, we're going to be installing a steel casing into the bedrock and it will be cemented in place from the surface to a few meters into the into the bedrock. This protects the aquifers that the local water wells tap for supply. We'll then continue to drill with fresh water down to about 200 meters and we'll set another casing, another cement casing, uh, another steel casing and cement it in place. And that will be cemented from, uh, from surface down to 200 meters. The borehole will then be advanced to about 900 meters Again, using municipal water supply, we'll add salt to that uh, to that water to try to match the chemistry conditions of the rock that we're drilling through. After the borehole is all drilled and completed and tested, we'll be installing a monitoring system in that well, in those wells. Uh, and these monitoring systems have about 20 sets of packers in there that will isolate different depths in that well. In addition, we we've, we've are planning long-term monitoring of local water wells uh, and surface water bodies. And this is part of the NWO Environments Group plan for understanding and protecting uh, water surface and shallow groundwater. Chantel, uh, yeah, next Thank you, question. you're on the next slide. Um, okay. Will tailings from the rock pile have an impact on our local water supply? So the rock pile will be made up of excavated rock from the repository and will be managed in such a way that it will not have an impact on our local water supplies. It'll be managed in the excavated rock management area, which will also include a stormwater management pond to collect and monitor runoff from the excavated rock pile. This pond will be dedicated to the excavation rock management area and its design will be based on local precipitation and soil conditions, as well as potential effects of climate change. The pond will be lined as required over its base and embankments for protection and to prevent water infiltration back into the ground. Any mining water containing salinity will be directed to a dewatering settling pond. This water will be managed, monitored, and if necessary, treated before being discharged. Water quality will be analyzed for compliance with applicable limits before the pond water is released. And then the next question, please. Back to you, Alec. So this is a good question as well. It's one that uh, has been heard in the, uh, in the community. Is rolling stewardship a good alternative option? No, rolling, st rolling stewardship is not a good solution for nuclear waste. Rolling stewardship uh, comprises hardened surface facilities and constant management of the used fuel for an indeterminate uh, amount of time. This really just kicks the problem down the road to a future generation, something that Canadians told us was not fair. We're enjoying the benefits of nuclear gener generated electricity now, so we should be the ones that are dealing with the waste problem, not our children or our grandchildren, etc. Uh, rolling stewardship relies on some possible future solution when actually one exists today, and that's a DGR. So as a geologist, I always like to think on the lo in long time frames, and we, we all do. So who's going to be around after 200 years to look after this waste? Who's going to be around after 1,000 years with rolling stewardship? The biggest perturbation that we have, we're going to experience in southern Ontario will be the next glaciation. It's coming. It's expected in about 60,000 years. How do you think a hardened surface facility will stand up to a two kilometer thick wall of ice coming our way? The answer is not well. A DGR is designed to withstand the load from multiple glaciation events without damage to the repository. Chantal? Next question. Thank you. Um, so the next question for you again, Alec, is will the Teeswater River or Great Lakes be affected? Again, a good question, one we've heard in the community. No, 
No radiation contaminants will travel to the Teeswater River or to the Great Lakes. Each component, we've talked about that earlier briefly tonight and in the last seminar, uh, that each component of the multi-barrier system is designed to isolate that used fuel from contacting water and ever moving. The final and best barrier that we talked about, barrier number five is the geosphere, and that's the rock. The repository will be located over 30 kilometers from Lake Huron and about 600 meters below the Teeswater River. There are several hundred meters of rock that are extremely tight to water flow to protect people and the environment. Studies of this exact same rock up at the Bruce nuclear site show that water takes millions, millions of years to move through the rock. In that time frame, our waste is no longer hazardous. The expected release of radioactive contaminants to the surface over the lifetime of this project is zero. Chantel. Okay, thank you, Alec. So now we go to the live Q&A portion of tonight's session. As a reminder, on the right side of your screen, there's a Q&A function into which you can input your questions. Please type your questions into that window. Some of my colleagues are monitoring the feed and will be sending questions my way to be answered. Okay, so the first question we have is, is the bentonite clay native to the location in question? Um, so Alec, I'll, I'll, I'll get started on it and if you wanna add to it, feel free. Um, so, so no, the, the bentonite clay is not native to um, either site. Um, and a lot of it comes from my, Wyoming. Do you have anything you could add to that, Alec? Uh, yeah, that's the bentonite is a very commonly used material. It's used in landfills. It's used around water wells. Um, and and Chantel's absolutely right. Some of the largest deposits, these are naturally occurring clays. Some of the largest uh, deposits are out in in Wyoming, where they make Wyoben, Wyoming bentonite. Okay, thank you. Okay. The next question I have is for you, Alec. Um, we all know about limestone caverns and stalagmite and stalactites where rock is cracked. Why would this limestone be any different? So different limestones at different elevations have different properties. And the uh, there are some limestones in certain areas that have, uh, that's called dissolution where waters have been moving, actively moving through that rock and dissolving the limestone. If water's not moving through that rock, if it's extremely tight, it won't dissolve. And that's just just uh, the, the, the uh, how it is. So we're not gonna, if water doesn't move through that rock, it will not dissolve and form those caverns. Okay, thank you. Okay, are the costs for fuel disposal being paid for in the current price of nuclear power or to be added later? Um, so the, the cost of nuclear fuel disposal is integrated into the cost of uh, nuclear power uh, currently and um, uh, and is, is funding a nuclear fuel waste fund, which is funding our operations. Um, Alec, did you, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think that's okay. got it. Okay. Um, Next question is, what can we learn from the salt mining operations in Goderich? Are you able to answer that one, Alec? Uh, salt mining in Goderich, so I would say that's a, a slightly different uh, geological environment. Uh, it's, uh, it's evaporate uh, deposits that, that form that salt. Salt is actually also a very good uh, uh, tight rock as well. So um, we learn about the geology uh, uh, from the Godrich area. Uh, those same salt deposits don't extend up into our uh, area of South Bruce. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question I think is also for you, Alec. Will the rock drilling only provide rock samples or will there also be rock porosity measurements at the lower levels? So there is a very large program of, of uh, sampling uh, 
planned for uh, for our, all our boreholes in South Bruce. Uh, they they contain uh, they uh, comprise a huge number of of analyses, including porosity. We also look at the uh, we'll also be analyzing. Uh, the strength of the rock. We also will be one of the key things that uh, we'll be uh, analyzing is the the trace amount of water that's in the pores of the rock, and we'll be analyzing that water, trying to figure out its age. So that's one of the key things. But uh, and we'll be doing that over the complete uh, uh, borehole, right from right from the uh, shallow bedrock right down to the uh, to the uh, bottom of the hole at about 900 meters. Thank you. Um, the next question: Is it possible that heat from the spent fuel can somehow damage or crack the rock surrounding the repository? Um, why don't you start with this one, Alec? OK, sure. Um, feel free to jump in as well. So heat will build up uh, in our repository over time, but the design of the repository, the spacing of our canisters is is very specific to limit that heat to under 100 degrees Celsius. And part of the function of the geosphere is to dissipate that heat. And uh, so the, the canisters will be in place such that that heat is, is dissipated and it won't do damage either to our, uh, either to our uh, ceiling materials or the bedrock at that, at that depth. Do you have anything to add to that, yeah, Chantel? Yeah, I, I can add to that. Um, I, can, I can add or emphasize that there will also be an upper limit on the allowable uh, heat load of used fuel containers. So the spacing of the containers in the repository will be designed with consideration of this heat load limit. Um, so when containers are being filled in the surface facilities, the used fuels um, being placed in the containers will be carefully tracked to ensure we don't exceed the heat load limits. Um, then measurements of the heat emanating from each container will be uh, made as a redundancy. This way, we're not sending a container to the repository that will heat the host rock beyond the repository's design. And all of this ensures the, that the integrity of the host rock is maintained and that we can trust that the multiple barrier system uh, will behave as expected, um, safely isolating the used fuel from the surface environment. Um, OK, I think um, this, I think it looks like maybe we're getting to the last question here. Um, how can you guarantee that food grown on top of the repository or the, the nuke dump will be safe for people to eat um, and and I can take that question um, so as we discussed today the local water sources will be unaffected by the repository because the repository is specifically designed to isolate the waste from the water supply and we have confidence in this because of the redundancies that are provided by the multiple barrier system agricultural products that are grown on top of the repository um, after closure would be unaffected by the repository uh, because the irrigation water, which is sourced um, from wells or surface water is protected. It's also important to know that today there are farms that operate successfully in locations adjacent to existing Ontario nuclear facilities. We know through regular testing of their produce and of the water sources for those farms that there are no impact, that there's no impact from radiation. Oh, it looks like we have time for one more question. We're in luck. Um, so what are the advantages of Tees Water over Ignace as a location? And what are the advantages of Ignace over Tees Water? Alec, I'm, I, I'm gonna pass this one over to you. So I, I, will, I will keep my observations to to a geologist's observations. From a social standpoint, I'll, I'll, I'll not uh, tackle that one. But um, both crystalline rock and sedimentary rock, uh, both of them can make very good effective geospheres to, to uh, protect the, uh, the fuel from water and the environment from the fuel. So if we look around the world, there are uh, studies going on in other 
crystalline rock environments. Several countries are looking at crystalline rock environments. Uh, Sweden, Finland are examples of that. Um, uh, people are also actively looking in sedimentary uh, sedimentary environments and and um, um, Switzerland is a is a, a good example of that. So there's not necessarily a, um, a a direct advantage of one over the other. It comes down to very site specific uh, uh, measurements and, and evaluations that we need to do to determine that a site is safe in the long term. OK, thanks, Alec. Um... So that wraps up our live Q&A session for tonight. Thank you for the questions that were sent. Um, can I please have the last slide? So thank you for coming to our session. As you know, we solicited questions before the session so we could answer them here. We'll be distributing answers to the questions you heard today, as well as others that we received over the next few days. Um, if you have already given us your email address, you'll receive this report, but if you haven't, and you would like to receive it, please give us an email at learnmore at nwmo.ca. We're hoping to conduct more sessions like these in the future. So if you have any feedback that we can use to improve future sessions, please don't hesitate to get into contact. Thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you.